Crisis is change that occurs quickly, suddenly, affecting our emotions and pushing us to react when we are less able to respond. Crisis always present us with complexity in search of simplicity. We yearn for a simple answer that will lead us out of chaos into meaning and relieve us of pain and confusion. One of the most common ministries is that of visiting the sick, whether in their homes, hospitals, or senior facilities. Sometimes a pastoral visit is a brief time to reassure the person that the church cares and to check if there is a specific need that can be handled. Often a pastor will drop in and find the pastor asleep and quietly leave a card and slip out of the room. When a patient is alone in a room, home or hospital, she does a lot of thinking. She often does a lot of worrying, her mind covering an array of what-if scenarios. What if I should die? What if it was worse? How would my children be taken care of? What if I can't work anymore? How will I support my family and myself? What if I can't pay the bill for all this medical care? Times of personal illness, whether perceived as major or not, can be special moments of ministry for a pastoral counselor. They are times to be a profound listener. Don't worry about telling the patient that the church cares. Your presence already provides that message. Time alone with the pastoral counselor is a gift care seekers would not request, but will value immensely if you will listen to their story. The parishioners with persistent or chronic and acute disease such as multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's disease or others experience a different spiritual path. Coming to grips with the idea that it will not get better takes digging deep with a person. Pastoral counselors can be a companion on that journey. A useful resource to suggest for those long-term issues is the practice of journaling. A journal is like a personal diary in which personal daily thoughts and feelings are recorded. It is suggested to counselees that they write in their private journal each day for 15 to 20 minutes. They may write longer if desired, but a brief time is essential for each day. Then ask them to not read what they have wrote for at least two weeks. That helps them notice the changes that are occurring in their thoughts with the passage of time. It is also important that individuals understand their journal is their private work. They need not share any of it with the pastor or counselor, but they are free to choose to share whatever they wish with the counselor or any others. In counseling, it can be useful to ask are there things that you're learning about yourself through journaling that you would like to share? Often people who are facing a terminal illness will journal as a way of leaving stories of their life or other important thoughts to their family and loved ones. The memorable work of C.S. Lewis in A Grief Observed is basically a shared journal of thoughts and powerful insights into loss. You may notice that the process and responses suggested for caring for people with persistent disease have few references to scriptures. Bedside visits that involve theological discussions are often an escape from hearing and responding to the pain of the counselee. Our own unresolved issues about illness and dying can cause us to run away from what the counselee hopes we will hear. We have all found ourselves changing the subject 
when the discomfort rose beyond our ability to tolerate it and to stick with the story at hand. It does no good to feel bad about our moments of inadequacy. It promotes our growth and competency when we recognize those moments and use them to increase our focus on listening to the other person. One of the most studied diseases around the globe and still one of the most frightening words is cancer. Though many types of cancer are now curable or are able to be controlled through medication, there are other types that continue to frustrate medical research and continue to scare us when we hear the diagnosis. Whether breast cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma, or other less common types, our heart stops for a moment if our doctor says the word. Such a diagnosis starts with a whirl of questions in the person receiving it. How bad is it? How much time do I have? Is there treatment? What about my kids? What should I tell them? These and a hundred other questions flash as it seems the future we assumed crashed before our eyes. A pastoral counselor who has experienced this or who is sensitive to this trauma is of immense help to the parishioner. Some ways of helping individuals through a life-threatening diagnosis include a ministry of presence. So many issues are raised by the diagnosis, illness, and treatment of cancer that only making a rare visit to see how the patient is doing is not sufficient pastoral care. Regular visits or office sessions can provide an outlet for the person to talk about what has emerged this week or in the last two weeks. A ministry of support groups has been proven very important. These groups can include a group of friends that meets regularly and a cancer patient group in which those on the same path can share care and resources. Support can also come depending on the ability of the patient from exercise groups, prayer groups, meditation and relaxation groups, and even art and literature groups. It is healing for the patient to have activities that are not defined by the cancer. A counseling ministry can be created to explore and consider modifying beliefs that contribute to fatalistic thinking and depression. Some people have self-destructive messages they received in childhood or interpreted in childhood that lead them to believe that disease is a way of God punishing bad people. Healing can be frustrated if the body is reacting in an inner belief it should die. Helping change that belief to a life-giving belief can make the medical treatment more effective. When people live with chronic stressors over a long period of time, the system has no time to restore itself, and the depletion of psychological resources can lead to major illness through the breakdown of the immune system or other weak links in the person's body. When people have few coping skills and many stressors, they are in an increased danger of major illness and accidents. It is helpful to remember that counselees express their emotions in diverse ways. First, both anger and anxiety can be expressed inwardly and outwardly. When emotions are expressed externally, it is easier for a pastoral counselor to pick up on the symptoms. Anxiety will present as nervousness, difficulty sitting still for long periods, difficulty focusing on a subject for more than a few minutes, and behaviors that may seem like avoidance and wanting to run away from a situation. Anger expressed overtly can run the rage from mild irritation and impatience to full rage. With stronger expressions of anger may seem stronger than the immediate situation might call for. 
with either emotion, the presence of symptoms not common for the person can give the observant pastoral counselor a cue to follow up in private for the rest of the story and the chance to be of help. All people experience life-changing events. Most will work their way through the events with their inner resources, faith, and friends. For major losses, it often takes a period of two to four years to fully make peace with an ending and move on. When people get stuck in the process of grief, their changed behavior provides a clue and in effect a cry for help. Intervening as a pastoral counselor can be a powerful ministry. Those who are wired more as extroverts will often ask to talk with a pastoral counselor. Those who are wired as introverts may not. Therefore, a key to effective ministry is to become sensitive to the subtle indicators of need. Each person has one or more memories within that include a place that was beautiful, peaceful, safe, warm, and refreshing. It may be a place that person visited in childhood on a vacation, the place she was born, a honeymoon location, or other place of solitude. Tapping into the inner resource can be a powerful stress reduction experience. The pastoral counselor can help the counselee use her inner resources to restore a time of centered peacefulness. Working with couples who are trying to renegotiate their relationship is a common task for the pastoral counselor. By focusing on what strengths a couple has exercised, and what future they wish to create, the arguments of accurate recall of history can be reduced and dropped, and progress can be made. If a couple clearly do not wish to restore the relationship or remake it into their desired quality, then the counseling moves to how they will manage a separation or divorce. With marital separation and divorce, the pastoral counselor may have only the opportunity to work with one party in the marriage. If it is clear that the relationship is irreconcilable, then the focus of counseling is on supporting the counselee through the transition process. With one party, and occasionally with both parties, the therapeutic task centers around the issue of erosion of love and the persistence of attachment. Couples often think of divorce as the end of a relationship. It is usually not. Rather, it is a major change in the nature of the relationship. This is especially true when children are involved. But even without children, couples often have developed a relationship with each other's families, siblings, friends, and colleagues. When the separation and divorce occur, all those relationships go through transitions. Often her friends will remain hers and his friends will remain his. Those people who are friends of both have a tough decision, either to choose one or go through an uncomfortable time of trying to support both or drop the relationships altogether. It is less important here to discuss all the reasons a marriage might come apart than it is to understand what people experience when it does fall apart. In marriages that last less than two or three years, a separation may occur that has little emotional trauma because it is likely the couple have not become attached enough to feel a deep loss. A marriage that exists for five or more years will usually exhibit the same types of emotional response as a marriage that has existed for 20 or more years. This time of endings can be very painful and disorienting and can create almost numbness in the person experiencing the ending. It appears to be true 
both for those who leave a relationship and for those who are left, although it may be felt first by the one being left. As the ending progresses and reality becomes clear, the second stage of transition emerges. And we call this the chaos time. The chaos may last for months, but gradually a glimpse of new beginnings will break in. Many individuals have gone through these stages, and many know them not to be neat, but rather weave in and out of one another and to eventually lead to a new beginning. If we reflect on our many new beginnings, we realize that most have not been planned but have risen out of a transition when a door or window opened and we saw a possible tomorrow. The pastoral counselor can help the counselee avoid rushing into a beginning to avoid the pain of an ending and helping the person slow down and take the time to learn what is needed to make the passage in a healthy manner. A powerful tool for this passage is journaling. Ask the counselee to write each day about his thoughts, feelings, confusions, dreams, actions, inaction, or anything at all. After each two-week period, ask the person to describe what he's learning about himself in this process. Remember, counseling supports the person while he or she designs their way to their future. Though we experience crisis as a one-time event, crises are happening all the time, at any time, somewhere in our world. The pastoral counselor has the wonderful opportunity to journey with care seekers on the road through their crisis to recovery, growth, and healing.